Your career, you started at, at, at a ridiculously early age. Was it 11? Well, I started getting paid when I was 11, <laughs> for which was a big day. I got a cheque for 10 shillings and sixpence, half a guinea from the BBC, and I had the sense not to cash it. I've still got it. <laughs> So what was, uh, that, what was that for? Half a guinea. That was for um, reciting a, a dramatic poem about um, an old man and his a depressed old man and his more cheerful self, in the, written in the old meter in Welsh, which is more or less like Anglo-Saxon. So and it was long. Right. And um, and I I won the national by Stafford, which is our big annual festival, reciting this thing. It, and um, and I was taken to the BBC. They picked me up off the field, the, the big pavilion, and took me to a studio, and I, I repeated it. And from then on, I worked regularly for radio until I went to RADA. Mm -hmm. I didn't know of any other drama schools. You know, I lived up a mountain in Wales. I knew nothing, and there was no theatre there either, so I don't know where I got this idea from. <laughs> but uh, that was my fixed idea, and I never changed my mind, and I knew the first thing I had to do was get to RADA somehow. I couldn't think of another way into the theatre. Because I was broadcasting a lot, um, my headmaster was very, very good. He loved the theatre and he loved drama, so he used to let me go all the time to Cardiff and to Swansea to record plays or whatever I was doing for, for the radio. And he would, he would coach me in the lunch hour or tea breaks on things that I had missed during the week. And, um, and so I... I did quite well at school because my mother said, if you don't stay in the first three in your class, you're not acting at all anymore. So I knew I had to work hard, so I did, and I, I stayed at the top of my class. But of course that meant I got a scholarship to university, which was not in my plan at all. <laughs> and my mother, of course, being a teacher um, and having come through a very bad depression in, in Wales, uh, said you have to go to the university because your education is the only thing no one can take away from you, which was a sort of mantra in Wales at that time. And, and I was stuck with it. I could see why she wanted me to do it, so, so I did it. And, but I didn't want to do it. But mercifully, it meant that I, I got a job at the BBC as an announcer as well. Yes. And as a news reader. Yes, so, so yeah. you were reading the news in, yes. in between your studies. Yeah, it was the back door of the university was opposite the front door of the of the BBC, so I just I just ran <laughs> between the two buildings. So I used to open the station in the morning at about half past six, because I was the most junior, and close it with the epilogue at night because I was the most junior. I was there at quarter to twelve at night and then run home and try and do a little bit of work. But and I was also on the rep, the, the acting company of the BBC, um, at the same time as well. And I was working for the Arts Council uh, in trying to form a Welsh National Theatre, uh, which we failed to do. Uh, but we used to tour um, things like Uncle Vanya in Welsh, for example, or new plays that were written. And one of them was written for me in the end, at the Saunders Lewis, our greatest playwright of that last century wrote me a play, and, um, and that got reviewed, although it was Welsh, it got reviewed by the English press, and that really helped me uh, get away to, to London and to, um, to Radio. Can I ask you, because when, when you speak to actors, and you say, what first started you off in the theatre, there's often something that has a performance aspect somewhere in their, in their childhood or past, and I'm just wondering if, were your parents at all, or grandparents, were they sort of Methodists and there was the whole yes. sort of that because the Methodist chapel is a bit like a music hall, isn't it? it well, it's, well, I wouldn't say it was a bit, not many laughs there. But, no, 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 not at all. But, <laughs> but as preachers would preach for over an hour, for example, and that was old fashioned rhetoric. So they would know how to bring the audience to a climax of fear and terror and misery and then cheer them up a bit. And, and you know, the, 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 the sermons were. were I think nowadays those guys would be actors. My mother used to order books, the, sort of the best plays of 1939 or whatever, so all the big West End hits would come bound, you know, to this little house on a hill, and, and my mother was very keen on them. And I used to read those over and over again. So I knew a lot about the, the contemporary theatre by the time I got to London. I was, I was very clued into who the actors were, 
and who the dead actors were. You know, we were very interested in the past as well in those days. Nowadays, acting is, more, is harder than it ever was, I think. But the pressure is worse now than it ever was. It's harder to be an actor, and it's hardly to be, harder to be a sane actor, to feel comfortable in your own skin, because the pressures now are huge, I think. And the, the, the culture of celebrity that we live in does not help. So you need to develop some kind of hidden inner core, a Bible, a book of rules, a book of whatever, and make your notes about what you think is good. And, and write them down in a, in a book and, and look at them from time to time because theatre changes all the time as well. It change, it change, it's changed so much, so many times <coughs> since I started. And it, it's very useful to have your own little notebook of what you think is the right thing to do and the right way to be because nobody much is going to help you anymore. You just get thrown into it. And, and the pressure of publicity and the cult of celebrity is just horrendous. You can't fight City Hall. You have to go with the flow whenever the change happens. You can't. As actors, we are not powerful enough to change the theatre. We can't do that. And now we're in an age of directors anyway. You know, it comes in stages. The actor manager was king uh, 60 years ago. The actor, the leading actor, ran the whole shoot. And the stage manager did everything else. And the actor would do the lighting as well. And, you know, they would do everything. Actors would do everything. They were top dog. And then that stopped. And, and the director moved in to be, at first, just an organizer of, uh, you know, the, the warmth, the heat, the place to rehearse in, the t practical things. And then, of course, the director has, has become more and more significant. And now we are, we are really in an age of directors. And that's another problem, <laughs> of course, because one of the main things you have to learn when you come into the theatre is how to deal with very different directors. You have to be a psychologist yourself. You know? And I'm all for trying new things. But when you're dealing with a classic, I saw one the other week in a very prominent theatre that was a disgrace because the verse was completely, was chopped up to pieces. You couldn't understand what the story was. You didn't know who was who, why they were doing what they were doing. The set was wrong. I mean, everything was wrong. And that did not help the play. And in a way, that, that's a great absence of humility because now we have directors who have to have concepts they have to put their their own work up there. Actors also have their own agenda. They want to make an impression, to be different maybe, and make an impression, catch the eye. It doesn't help the play, and we are there really to... The play does not exist without us, but we are there to serve the writer, I think. And that involves a certain amount of humility, which seems to be completely missing at the moment in this age of concept, where you know you, you go to a play and you can hardly recognize what it's supposed to be. I, I won't talk about anything that's on now, but I'll talk about, I went to see a Sean O'Casey, for instance, which is, is a classic, you know, his, his English, the Irish writers write beautiful, beautiful English. And his English is as precise and as cadenced as Shakespeare in a very different way, working class Dublin. And this was a play set in 1916. And it was mind-bendingly difficult to follow because everyone was dressed in modern dress. The women were in ripped jeans and uh, tight tops and you know everything that these women would never wear. Um, they broke up the speech. They broke up all the speeches because obviously someone had decided that the audience wouldn't want to hear a fast, cadenced speech, which it's got to be. I mean, there's no other way of doing it, Casey. And, um, and also they decided to, to break off, if they had a scene of more than three lines, well, instead of talking to the person you're talking to, halfway through you would break off and speak to the audience. And in the audience, I found I was, it was like Brecht. I was so alienated. I thought, what am I supposed to do now? You know, am I supposed to take you? Where am I supposed to look? You know, I really felt embarrassed to be talked to. And then they would turn back to this poor actor who was waiting for them to turn back and finish the speech to them. Now, this, to me, was willful. It was absolutely dreadful. 
I don't think any of the critics that we have at the moment, the ones that wrote about that play anyway, I don't think they knew how a Casey was supposed to be done. So they're supposed to help in the movement of getting good theatre on. You know, I'm not against critics at all. And they're much nicer to, each, to us than we are to each other very often. But, but it's not that. They just don't know enough now. They do not have the, the background, the culture, to know how it's supposed to be. And they don't know enough about the past. And, um, Peter Hall said, oh, well, in 10 years' time, he said, there won't be a West End. All the plays worth doing, the plays that you see now in the West End, will be done at the National Theatre on the South Bank. And the West End will be just a place to do shows. You know, it won't be what it is now. Yeah, com com but commercial theatre had a lot of class yes. in the old days, but not anymore. I worked in the, in the commercial sector for a long time after I left Stratford, and my private life made it essential for me to be there, not out of town in Stratford. And it was really a place where, where you could do classics all the time. But what was it like to, to see that change? That think? happened as I came out of RADA. It changed yes. in the year I yes. came out. So these things can happen to you. You know, you think you know where you are, you think you're on the right track, and you, you're sort of au fait with what's going on. You come out, and suddenly everything changes, and it can happen at any moment. I came out of RADA, and before you knew where you were, nearly all the really handsome young men who'd gone into the theatre from RADA, who had glittering uh, careers ahead of them, were really having a bad time. Uh, because suddenly the working class hero came in and it was all North Country. It wasn't Welsh didn't count. That was really difficult. So I was sort of marooned really in the middle of RP. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, because there were no Welsh plays, but there were loads of plays. Osborne, as you know, was the biggest one of all, I suppose. Okay. All that Royal Court stuff, the Royal Court became immensely important, the most important theatre. And suddenly it was all North Country, and it was nearly all men. It was really tricky. So suddenly polite theatre was whoosh, it was gone, you know. The, the, the big management uh, West End was, was finished, more or less. Coward. He was so fanatical about his scripts, and he was around, of course, so mm -hmm. there was terrible trouble if you changed a word. If you change a word, you do change a lot in Coward. Get a word wrong, and it, it sort of starts falling apart. And he, he, was, he would insist on everyone knowing all the text before they ever came to the first day of rehearsal, that there was nobody had a book in their hands, which was anathema to English actors. You know, they would hate that. They'd say, oh, but I don't know really how I'm going to say it yet. He said, that's not the point. This is rehearsing, not learning. And it is very true, actually, ever since. I've tried to, to learn before, before the rehearsals start, because... Learning is a different thing altogether. You change all the time. But repetition is, is so important. I had never realized the importance of it. When I was young, I did not realize how important it was. And I realize now that um, repetition is a wonderful thing because it frees you. And repetition, athletes know this. Athletes know repetition brings change. Repetition is not set in concrete. You're not, you're not kind of fixed in what you first do. You change it all the time, but you're free to change it, and it gives you the self-confidence and the freedom to experiment. But you have to know those words so well. I don't think I ever, because I have a very, very good memory, I don't think I ever learned things properly, you know, when I was young. Because I used to know them, but I didn't realize how hard you have to work at the text. Have you ever done any autumn? No, but my dear friend Beryl Reed oh, yes. was a mistress yes, yes, of yes, Joe yes, Orton, yes. and I worked with Beryl, and she used to quote Orton to me all the time. And now, now that's interesting because she was also terribly good at um, at restoration. At restoration. Uh, uh, Beryl had to learn everything. In those days, there were cassette tapes, and she used to have it on the on the windowsill and play it over and over and over again. But consequently, Beryl never forgot anything. No. 
Now, when I finish a play, I forget it. She knew plays she did 20 years before. She, it was all in there, and she could quote from... She was an absolute mistress oh. of that genre of high comedy. And I asked her once, because she was raised as a musical artist. She was not an actress until late in life. And she was a, a musical performer when she was 15 years of age. And I, I asked Beryl one day, I said, Beryl, what is it that gives you that wonderful clarity of, of, of voice projection? And she said, oh, it's very easy, dear. She said, my mother was profoundly deaf. <laughs> and I was the only person who could really communicate with her. So she would communicate with her in a room, not by shouting at her, which a lot of actors now stand on the stage and shout, and you can't hear them. But she could, she could clearly communicate. And that, that is it, she said. It was because I really have to think about what I say. I mean, when you talk about the past, for instance, uh, it, my sense of how to do Shakespeare properly, well, I hope properly, came from a man called William Powell, who, when was William Powell? He, he directed for two years at the Old Vic in 1929, I think, right. and then never again. And he completely changed our attitude towards Shakespeare. And he taught, he discovered Dame Edith Evans, who was one of our greatest ever actresses. And he um, made her a professional, she was a, a, an amateur milliner, and he found her and he gave her Cressida in, uh, Troilus and Cressida, in a semi-professional company that he had in London somewhere. And his, his method of, of speaking Shakespeare is worth reading because um, his name is William Powell, P-O-E-L, and he explains how you ought to be able to reproduce some of Shakespeare's dialogue, a lot of the prose, in exactly the same tone as you would modern. I mean, Hail Caesar should sound exactly like Good Morning, Headmaster. You know, it, it, the modern cadence will do. But he said, you, you have to, when you have a long speech, and this is very difficult to do, but it's worth practicing, you, th there's always a thought, one thought that goes all the way through. What happens when you break up the verse, say, uh, when you've got 14 lines, you lose that, that train of thought halfway through. You have got to keep that, the sense going all the way through this speech on the page, even though you're doing things in brackets, you're doing subclauses, you're doing sub-subclauses, adverbial clauses, adjectival clauses, all sorts of things come in there, jokes even, but all the way through it, at the same time, is the sense of the whole thing. Mm. And you have got to keep that pulse going, which means not stopping. If there's no reason to stop, because the mind works faster than any computer, and all you have to do in order to keep going is think faster. I mean, no, nobody, our minds don't go think, speak. <coughs> it happens at the same moment. You, you, it goes so f it's faster than any computer can be. So it is terribly important to practice maintaining the sense all the way through. And he said sometimes you have to study that speech until you're sure which are the important words on every line. Sometimes it's only two that need to be wrapped out very clearly. They're never prepositions. They are never, hardly ever nouns. They're verbs and adjectives and adverbs usually. Or oh, they're little clauses that have to come out very, very clearly on every line. But in order for that to happen, you have got to vary your tone as well. Otherwise, people will stop listening if you're talking on the same note all the time. They'll absolutely get bored stiff and they won't listen to you. So you've really got to run up and down the octave very often. And you can do that quite naturally. Uh, because that keeps people interested and a little bit surprised. It keeps them listening to you. And then you really have got to sacrifice maybe six words that you don't need. They have to come out very fast. They have to be heard, but they mustn't be emphasized. In order to emphasize the seventh, the ninth, onto the next line, the first, the fourth, the sixth. But you have to decide which are the important words. And that makes you really think about that speech. And it's the same with any with restoration. You know, you have to know which words to pick out, and they have to go zinging out so that everybody. Otherwise, they're not going to understand what you're saying. And I, I was sitting in a theatre the other night, and it, it's it's terrible because you do not, even if you know the play, you are not understanding because people are stopping to think. 
and then they're showing a bit of emotion, which is so vainglorious because we don't want to see an actor's emotion. We want to feel it in the play. You've got to, you've got to present the writer's play and stick your own bits in as, as best you can. You know, but the main thing is to keep the play going. Because you've done a lot in Broadway as well, mm. haven't you? Yeah. What would you say the difference is between... Oh, it's much nicer. And Broadway. Much <laughs> nicer being on Broadway. <laughs> it's oh, it means something. Oh, yes, it does. It really does mean something. Doing a Broadway show is really something. And, um, and it also, you get a real feeling that you're in something important because the city of New York acknowledges the fact that theatre is a big chunk of revenue. Now, it's a big chunk of revenue here, but the government will never admit it. You know, they will never consider that theatre is important in any way. They put more taxes on it and try to wreck it, really. But um, I wish they've succeeded in doing, I suppose. But in America, you just feel you're really part of the, of the acting community in a very small space. And you see people from all the other shows, when they've finished work, you know what cafe they're going to be going to, you'll see them where they're having lunch or supper. And Broadway Cares is very strong. And you, know, you do things for on behalf of Broadway, of the charity, all the time. And it's, it's just wonderful. You can be in a play in the West End. I remember my first musical, there was a huge cutout of me outside <laughs> the Lowell Coward. And I was standing in front of it one day, and a friend of mine, an actor, came by and said, Sean, hi, I haven't seen you for ages. I said, no, because I'd been in this huge success for about nine months. And I was waiting for someone, and he said, uh, oh, it's great to see you. Uh, what are you doing these days? <laughs> <laughs> I remember you, in, in Ken, in your memoirs, talking about watching Edith Evans yes. when you were uh, a young actor yes. and trying to work out mm. what it was that made her I so know. superlative. I worshipped her. So um, I wanted to be in this play, which I didn't want to be in, because I wanted to be on the stage with Edith, watching her and learning something. You know, I could just watch her doing it. And, uh, of course, what happened is I couldn't see her doing anything. She, I didn't, don't know what she did. It was just her magic, you know, and it was impossible to see what she did. She never prepared for a gag. She was the mistress of comedy, especially restoration. Yes. Gym, because people used to say she lived in the restoration, probably. You know, and she just turned up in the West End. And she was a wonderful milliman. She was, a, oh, she played all those parts. And she, again, had the most eccentric, wonderful diction. Oh, yes. It was eccentric. Oh, yes. And she was trained by William Powell, of course, yes. who should be read. And, um, and she, um, Edith would, she, she was not very good in this play, actually, <laughs> because she hadn't read it. She was quite old. And she was, she was playing a tycoon in the city, and she'd gone to Hardy Amy's, who was a great, uh, expensive British designer, to have evening clothes made for these scenes. And no one had the nerve to tell her that she was actually working in the city of London in an office, you know, playing a CEO of a big company. So there she was in full evening dress at 10 o'clock in the morning in these scenes, oh. and carpet slippers, because she had very bad feet. And she used to say, I, I really don't understand this play. I don't like this play at all. And then she would sometimes stop and not be doing anything very much. And, and one day I said to Edith, is there anything I'm doing wrong here where, where maybe, you know, that doesn't suit you? When, and she said, what? oh, that. She said, no, no, no. I don't do anything there. She said, I don't understand that. And when you don't understand something, you can't act it. She said, I stop. And then when I when I understand again, I pick it up. <laughs> and, she, and she said, I could never tell a lie. So she would never have to lie on, in her acting, you know. I thought, wow. And then, you know, I don't know how she'd get on today, but uh, but uh, she was amazing. And but you, she was such a mistress of comedy that but what you never saw her preparing for the gag waiting for the feed, watching, you know, you can nearly always watch somebody, it's like a horse going over a jump, you can see a comic working up to the, to the gag and successfully doing it. Edith, you couldn't see her do anything and she would bring the house down, the house down, 
with, with effortlessly. She would never, never do an effect. You know, but she was incredibly funny. Because it was authentic, because it was reflection of... But it was the truth as far as she was concerned. Yes, she yes. was deadly serious yes. about it all. Well, I think Beryl Reed again had, had Beryl, this yeah. quality, and particularly on film where she could, you could, you could, she just a look from her eyes oh, would yes. prep you yeah. that you knew that something fabulous yeah. was going to come. Yeah. Who else do you think from 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 that stable of, of great characters who were who were also great characters? Who do you think in comedy as as uh, playing well, comedy? Oh, too was a great farceur. He was very interested in the farces of the twenties. And he revived uh, a farce called Plunder, which had not been done since 1930-something, to do for his mother theatre, the Bristol Old Vic, where he went to do a season for nothing. And um, we read and read different plays for him to do. And one of the plays was a play called Plunder, written by Ben Travers, who was a big, big Aldrich theatre farce writer and wrote for... Roberts and Hare and yes. all those great farceurs. Yes, yes, yes. Well, which don't, they don't exist anymore, these guys. And um, and I, went, I think it was one of the best things he ever did. It was so funny. People were lying on the floor crying with laughter. And he was, he'd been to see, he took me to see uh, one of those old actors in Richmond one day and I was just out of Rada and I didn't know why we were going to Richmond to see this Rookery Nook to see Rookery Nook Ralph Lynn who'd created it was playing it he was dead practically you know he was, I think he died a month later and he, this old man played this juvenile in Rookery Nook well, the theatre was full of actors. I didn't realise that they were, it was, we walked in and every actor in London was down at Richmond watching Ralph Lynn, who were the things he could do with a, with a telephone and a wire, you know, when he was making a phone call, was so funny. You didn't know, but uh, they don't exist anymore. Yeah. But O'Toole used to go and make notes, and Rex Harrison, whom I worked with, was one of the greatest actors I worked with, I have to say. Um, he was so so incredibly clever that you you would you wouldn't know really. He was so well rehearsed. It's what I was talking about. The muscle memory was so profound. He was so on top of his material always that you didn't know if he was acting or whether he'd stopped and he was actually saying something to you. You know, it was like being on on sheet ice acting with him. You just didn't know what was happening quite. You know, it was going so fast the whole thing. And he, when I got to know him a bit, because he was a brute and not very nice to anybody, including me, he, um, I, I said to him, "What did you did you always know you wanted to do light light comedy?" Because he was a master light light comedian. And he said, "Oh yes," he said, "I was always wanted to do it. I used to go," he said, "and watch." Um, the plays when I was very young, when I was a teenager. He said, "I would go and watch the same play eleven times." I would get in and stand in the gods and watch his favourite performers, the fast actors of that period, working until he really kind of, he learned by watching them. And I talked to one of, a man who was supposed to be the greatest actor of, of the last century, Wilfred Lawson. He was the actor's actor. And, um, and he was also a bit of a drunk and he had epilepsy and all sorts of things wrong with him. But he was a great, great actor. All actors revered him. And, um, I asked him one day, I was playing, he was playing my grandfather, how we were in Birmingham, and uh, in the early hours of the morning, I said, Wilfred, who would you say is, is the greatest actor now? Because there was Ralph Richardson, there was John Gielgud, there was Laurence Olivier, there was somebody else, I don't know, but there were, you know, four or five. Michael Redgrave. Michael Redgrave, exactly. And I said, who, who would you say? And he said, oh, he said, um, oh, Rex. I said, no, really? Because you don't think of light comedians as being the greatest actor of the age. He said, oh, yes, he said. Um, he took the wrong turning. But it was a deliberate turning that he took. And I did a play with Rex where he, we were in a set which had a dais on it with a whole um, study, and it was his study, and outside there was a phone on the wall, and he 
being an international movie star, was not accustomed to not having his own phone. You know, there were no mobile phones in his dressing room, and, you know, it was a disaster. And he needed to talk to somebody, and he couldn't make the phone work because he didn't know how to put money in a box, you know. And he tore it off the wall <laughs> and threw it, and then came into this rehearsal room, which was about ten times the size of this, and there were maybe 24 of us in that room, including the director, and everyone was flattened against the wall because he came in, he got up on the dais, and he threw every single piece of furniture off the dais onto the floor and broke it. It was a whole set. And you thought, and meanwhile, raging against the incompetence and the, the sort of narrow mindedness of the Brits, and oh, it was all going on. And the voice was huge, and everyone was terrified. And we just stood, and you could see what a wonderful King Lear he would have made. <laughs> I suppose we get a little glimpse of that in My Fair Lady, where it's not just like comedy. There's, there's, yeah. there's a prowling yeah. darkness. He was a that. nasty piece of work. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> so, so I. I heard that he was the illegitimate son of King George V, I think. No, really? Yes. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, so perhaps he got cheated out of the Maybe throne or did. something yeah. like that. His wife told me once he was the only man she knew who sent the wine back in his own house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not so long ago you played Lady Bracknell. Lady yes. Bracknell. Yes. Um, it's a very interesting part, Bracknell, isn't it? And yeah. what do you think of this fashion for men playing it at the moment? Oh, gosh, I'd forgotten that. Yes, because there were lots at that time. Uh, uh, it hadn't been played by a woman for ages when no, I played it. That's right. That's right. And I played it first in Washington, and then I played it back here in another production, and then I played it the following year. So I played it for a long time. And it was only in the, at the end of the second year that I got comfortable in it. I, I found it the most nightmarish. Oh, it was scary. I was so scared every single night. And at the, it was in the third production that I suddenly thought, I'm okay in this, I can do this. But I, until then, I was so nervous. I was, Why do you think that was? I don't know. There's something about that part that's so difficult. You've got to come on. It's very short. You have a long wait in the dressing room. Everybody else gets nicely warmed up. And you have to come on and you have to strike 12 immediately. There's no working up to it. There's no minute where you can get your bearings and slide in. There's no, no preparation. You're on. And you've got to be it, you know. Oh, it was difficult, mm. very difficult. Is there anything, right, this brings me nicely on to, because you've done, you've done, it seems to me, that you've done almost everything that you could possibly do in almost every medium related to the stage. What haven't you done that you'd really like to do? Well, I didn't do a stage production of, of Antony and Cleopatra, which is a part I really wanted mm. to do, and I was offered it at the Vic, and I had to turn it down in that period where I couldn't do everything. And that was one of the things I resented. I really wanted to do it. And I, I rehearsed it with Alan Bedell. When we did Man and Superman together, he said, why don't we do um, Anthony and Cleopatra? And I said, oh, yes. Because I thought, at least I would get a chance to do it. And, um, and it, it didn't, uh, for some reason, it didn't come off. We, we, but we rehearsed it, and I worked so hard on it. And I really wanted to do it. And. Um, Finally, I, I did it on the radio with Robert Stevens. He was a very, very good yes. um, Anthony. And so I got to sort of do it, but it's not the same as doing it on stage. You, did a, you did a Romeo and Juliet not that long ago. No, it was about in, five years in ago. Which, uh, in which you played... It was set in a nursing home, wasn't it? So the care parents home. were the children. Care home. Yes. yes, it was a care home, yeah. And it worked. It worked, didn't it? But yes. not totally. I was, I was looking, last night actually, I was looking at my, my theatre notebook, and it says that somebody said, talking about somebody's Romeo and Juliet, they said, it, it works because of the, the absolute terror on the streets, the blood, the heat, the danger on the street. The death of Romeo and Juliet is redemptive because the, the, the two families reconcile after the death. Otherwise, it said, if you don't get that terror on the street, then there's no redemption. Right. They, they die for nothing, you know. And that's the only thing that didn't work in the production I did was, because we were a company of old people, 
the, the fights on the street <laughs> couldn't be that dangerous, you know, the people got smothered with pillows, you know, and hit with sticks or zimmer frames, you know, and it just was not enough. So the, the play, the, I took, for my mind, the, 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 all the, the, the speeches, Romeo and Juliet's speeches, fit older people. You think, how could young people ever say this? You know, it's so profound. That's fine. First love can be very passionate, whatever age you are. And, um, but that didn't work. And I did never mention it to anybody, even the director, because I thought, it's never going to really work, because that doesn't look... You can't see the blood on the street, and you really need to see that horror. So being an actor is the toughest of all the jobs, I think. It really is. But it's the best. <laughs> oh, um, thank you very much, everybody. And, th and thank you well, very much. Thank you. Thank you.